Thank you very much uh, for the introduction. Uh, this work is based on discussion and, and uh, with, that I had with uh, Guido Bertoni, Maria Chiara Molteni, and uh, Filippo Melzani from ST Microelectronics. And uh, well, um, today I'm going to talk about a strange journey that I took through algebra and uh, cryptography and uh, what I have learned along the way. In fact, I hope that you will find the topic enjoyable as enjoyable as I did, and uh, this maybe uh, might spark some, uh, some interest in you. So first, me, let me outline the context of this work, which is about side channel attacks and uh, crypto against cryptographic circuits. In particular, I'm interested in those exploiting probes on the circuits nodes and uh, how static glitches can enhance them. So the attack model that I focus on is the conventional probing security. And uh, I would like to note that uh, as observed by Alexander Duke and other authors in 2014, conventional probing security is the most conservative one with respect to other uh, you know, uh, attack models like uh, uh, noisy leakage and random probing security. So we're working on a pretty conservative uh, model now. Um, so I started to work to connect the dots. In fact, and I try to, I will try to shed some light, lights into some existing ideas. My interest in the topic started uh, while working with uh, Guido Bertoni on the effect of glitches on the vulnerability. And he referred me to, to some initial works on glitch algebras, which I eagerly consumed. For example, I discovered that static hazards have been tested, uh, treated with algebra since uh, as early as the 1948. And however, I struggled to connect the, those works with the current understanding of glitches in, the, in what we call today robust probing security. This approach started with the work of Sebastian Faust in 2017 and that treats glitches in a worst case way and is supported by several empirical observations. I will show that the rec reconciliation that I'm talking about is possible although a bit intricate. So uh, let us consider the circuit on the left and assume that A or B are uh, sensitive uh, values that we want to protect. We assume that the attacker is able to measure the power associated with C because, for example, there is a high capacitance associated with it. Well, it turns out that if C is correlated, C is correlated with the both the values of A and B, so uh, one might devise a correlation attack to derive them. The circuit on the right instead shows how to fix this problem through masking. The countermeasure, as it is called, has a uniformly random value of R uh, called mask, allowing C0 to become uncorrelated with A or B. If, however, we get access to C1, we would recover again either A or B. So we do say that uh, we've sh shifted the problem from a so-called first order vulnerability to a second order by variate one. A probing attack is even worse than that because it allows the attacker to measure the intermediate nodes, even the inputs to the end gate as we see it here. So uh, a deep probing secure circuit is a circuit where up to deep probes, you're not able to derive the inputs. This picture shows a multiplication circuit that is protected against one probe, but of course fails for two probes we say that this is one probing secure. To build a deep probing secure implementation of a circuit, one applies masking to the input variables A and B. And in this case, it introduces the so-called shared representation of the inputs. Here you can see a zero, a one, those are all uh, you know, uh, shared representation of a single value, which is A. The multiplication that you see here is very important. Uh, it's, um, it's, it appears everywhere in any uh, important uh, digital circuit, uh, cryptographic digital circuit. So it's very, it has been the focus of uh, several works in the past. So assume now that you have two functions, G and F, that are probing secure. What can we say about their probing, uh, their composition? Well, not much in the sense that uh, if the gadget uh, respect, if the circuits F and G respect some additional assumption, we can ensure that the resulting circuit is probing secure. 
At the moment, uh, there are two main ways to compose gadget addressing also addressing the problem that we are going to see later, that is aesthetic hazards. The first is trivial composability, and it has been introduced recently by Cassier and other authors. It says that it is possible to build independently G and F so that when they are composed, they are probing secure. And these constructions are called uh, probing, probing isolating non-interferent, which is a kind of a mouthful, but uh, this is the, 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 the name that has been given to, uh, to these functions. The other notion is optimized composability. And it says that you can build, for example, a slightly less complex G, but then you should find something for F which ensure that the composition is probing secure. Note that F and G must be strong non-interferent. Uh, a notion that was first introduced by Gil Barth in 2016, which we're going to see uh, next in detail. So this composition is basically and potentially less complex in terms of randoms, uh, random value and register than the trivial one, but it is more difficult to obtain. And uh, of course, not all non-interfering function will make it in this case. For uh, example, uh, for the case that you see here, Jean-Sébastien Coran proved in 2015 that um, the composition uh, of uh, non-interferent and strong non-interferent functions is not non-interferent. So non-interference is usually described as a notion of simulatability. And it says that if by substitu substituting a few shares with completely random values, you can get the same probability distribution over the outputs then your circuit is simulatable with fewer shares. This means that you won't get any useful information to reconstruct the secret up to a certain number of outputs from the circuit. There is an alternative view that one can get from correlation matrices. The matrix you see on the right is the compressed, compressed version of the underlying Walsh transform of the circuit that uh, we have seen in the previous slide. Rows indicate how many probe we consider within each uh, function f or g, while columns indicate the number of shares with which it is correlated. From the matrix on the right, we can see that, uh, for example, the composition of uh, these two functions f and g is not strong non-interferent, because, for example, if we put two probes um, within uh, pi f and pi g uh, on on the circuit, we can get a value that is correlated with three shares of the uh, actual um, input of the circuit itself. So now if the circuit has glitches, how much, uh, how, how my, how much uh, information can we get from the probes? Well, the current research uh, trends uh, <clears throat> treats glitches uh, on a node as a probe with extended superpowers. In practice, it allows to get all the share of a given cone of logic up to uh, a register. It's just a kind of worst case analysis. The circuit that you see here in this slide is a multiplication gadget inspired to uh, the mayor uh, and other authors uh, published in 2000, 2019. And let us consider the upper orange circle here. This represents a, uh, a probe on the XOR between R5 and R4 and the uh, conjunction between A1 and B3. Uh, this will be, uh, in, in this kind of uh, glitch model, this will be correlated uh, with the um, uh, contemporaneous, simultaneously with R5, R4, A1, and B3. So with two probes over C0 and another XOR, the, the other uh, orange circles that you see here, we could get three shares of B with only two intermediate probes. This means that the gadget is not strongly robust non-interferent. So at the beginning, I I must admit that uh, this type of reasoning left me a little bit puzzled because uh, uh, it looks very far from any probabilistic reasoning 
that is uh, based on simulatability or correlation matrices, or any known algebraic approach uh, for reasoning about static hazards. So my question was, is, there, is it possible that there is in fact a needed connection? Uh, and let us find out. But before, we should take some effort, some effort in systematizing the work done by previous authors on glitches, which is based on algebra. So the systematization that I'm going to present is based on the concept of functor algebras uh, or F algebras. Uh, for our specific purposes, a functor is a higher order function that maps function to functions by respecting composition. And a functor algebra is a carrier set and uh, plus a function that we call U in this case, um, that uh, maps from uh, an embellished domain TA into A itself, as you can see here. For example, the embellished domain uh, one plus A times A, the one that you can see here, means uh, actually the Cartesian product of A with itself union the singleton set. It's another sort of uh, you know, notation um, that allows to express these sets um, in, a, in a simple way. So the function U corresponds to the actual algebra. In fact, it, it collects the function from either the singleton set or A multiplied with itself uh, into A itself. For our purposes, you might encode, for example, the identification of a specific element in uh, the, the, the carrier or uh, a binary operation over the uh, carrier itself, like, as we, like you see here. So it is possible to define a sort of connection uh, between algebras that uh, respect some property. This connection is called morphism and allows to create bridges across uh, domains. We will use a squiggly arrow, as you can hear, as you can see here on the on the right, to indicate such connection. And uh, note that this corresponds to the commuting diagram on the left. That this kappa composed with C is equal to um, phi composed with the image of kappa through the functor T. Um, there is a theorem formulated in the 1968 by Langbeck, which says that if there is an algebra from which there is a single morphism to any other algebra, then the carrier domain is this, is this fixed point. For us mere mortals, uh, this uh, complex uh, sentence could be uh, summarized in this way. Uh, once we, we fix the functor, uh, there might be a unique construction function from a supercarrier to any other carrier. And this supercarrier is called the uh, uh, initial algebra. For our purposes, uh, we are lucky because for a functor signature representing Boolean algebra operators, this initial algebra exists. And this, it is exactly the domain of possible Boolean expression and we, we will call it XB. The function kappa phi, the algebra morphism kappa phi, is called catamorphism and corresponds to a precise recursive definition derived from the non-recursive phi here. And all formalization of glitch algebras that we are going to see in the later, uh, later on, uh, in fact, they correspond to some kind of catamorphism. Um, so, Ideally, our target would be to build a morphism between algebra from the representation of a circuit into something that represents vulnerable inf the vulnerable information flow associated with glitches. We'll see if this is true in the following minutes. So the most cited algebra for glitches is the Brodzowski one. Uh, this algebra is an attempt to count the maximum number of changes of a wire given its input transient. For example, let us consider the circuit on the left. A change on x, zero, uh, on x uh, from zero to one produces a change on the state of the circuit signals. 
And depending on the delays of the circuit, this change might happen following certain intermediate states, as shown in the uh, state transition diagram on the right. For example, if we consider only S4, the output value of this circuit, we note that it might go through a, at worst the value 0, 1, 0, 1 during the transition um, from, of X from 0 to 1. This is called a transient. So Brzozowski uh, and, and the other authors of the paper show that if we consider the set of all transients, there is a suitable algebra beta such that it computes the worst case transient. The authors show some equalities with ternary algebras, but do not provide any way to compute these transients if, if not by simulation. In fact, the, the functor is not able to represent full expression with variables, but only expression of constant values. So this requires choosing which transit is associated with each variable, input variable of the circuit, and makes the solution dependent on these assumptions. And uh, more importantly, their, their um, algebra doesn't consider a circuit that contains registers. Another notable approach uh, to glitches is due to Serge Vaudenay and dates back to 2017. He defines a glitch function that will go gamma from the Boolean expression domain <clears throat> to the space of expressions that count glitches. This scheme is a little bit more convoluted and can be expressed as a variant of algebra catamorphism, which is called paramorphism, another funny term that indicates the fact that the underlying recursion scheme needs to access both the original expression and the reduced one. And uh, it works symbolically with variables that don't glitch, but need, need the assumption, needs assumptions about variables that do glitch. For example, let's, uh, let us consider a simple conjunction between two variables and assume that uh, y doesn't glitch. So if gamma, equals, uh, gamma of y equals zero means that, uh, we assume, that we assume that gamma doesn't glitch. Um, so um, the, the algebra proposed by Vaudenay says that uh, um, the glitch count associated to the end of x and y in this case is dependent only on the glitch count of x, gamma x, and the original value of y with a very simple multiplication. So unfortunately, the original authors admit that this scheme cannot cover all the type of glitches. For example, what happens when both x and y glitch it is impossible to compute uh, in this scheme without any other assumption. And finally, also in this case, the authors does, do not consider, the author does, does not consider uh, register within the uh, circuit specification. Lastly, uh, Bloem et other authors in 2018 proposed the first, uh, you know, full-fledged catamorphism into something that represents a correlation between the input variables of the circuit and uh, the actual information that we can get from the probes, from the glitches it, themselves within the circuit. And uh, the rules are derived from a Fourier uh, expansion of the circuit itself, uh, but then collapse gates by, by forgetting uh, the actual weight of the spectral coefficients and uh, they propagate only variables as you can see here on the right. So um, the fact is uh, that the work actually to model glitches uh, introduces some gate copying, which to my understanding cannot be modeled entirely with an algebra. So we're going to co compare ourselves with these uh, works um, that have shown up to now. So uh, the question is the previous approaches map into either space of the tran either the space of the transients or the space of expression that count um, uh, the, the signal uh, glitches and uh, they don't provide immediate information on the correlation of the outputs with the inputs and do not incorporate register so let's see how we can uh, instead propose uh, introduce an algebra that counts accounts for all these uh, notions so first of all, consider that we focus on a non-feedback circuit 
that contains zero or more register and uh, where the inputs are the indexed, uh, indexed with integers. So for example, x0, x1 are the inputs of our circuit. So we extend our um, algebra signature function to, uh, to do this and we'll cause, call the signature functor f. So um, as another operator that we introduce in our signature fun functor, uh, we introduce the excl exclamation mark, which indicates an expression that is sampled by a register. This is the same notation used by Gilbert in 2018. So the uh, proposed algebra is the following. So the, 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 the overall goal is to really try to model the current understanding of uh, you know, extended probes for, uh, for glitches, such as the one proposed by Faust, Faust 2017. And the main idea is to unfold the original expression of our circuit into a set of expression which represent at the same time the output value, uh, the output of extend the extended probes that we can put on the circuit and the set of inner probes. And the, the algebra that you see here tries to compute this in a, in a recursive way. So the output probe expression are built incrementally to emulate the worst case extended probe. That is the one which is correlated with all its inputs. As you can see in equation um, three and four in this case, we use the end to, uh, uh, to let's say, um, create a single output probe from two uh, um, output probes. Uh, this is because we want, uh, this is due to the fact that the end has a very peculiar spectral behavior, um, but uh, in the sense that it is correlated with all the input variables. But any bent function might be used in this case. So in equation three, uh, five, sorry, uh, we can see that uh, when we encounter a register, we, uh, the output probe that comes from uh, you know, the inner parts of the circuits is uh, considered as an input probe for the upper uh, you know, levels of the uh, circuit representation. So let us see an example. This is an example of the operation of the previous algebra uh, when, when we uh, apply, um, apply it to a very uh, simple circuit. In this case, uh, uh, the circuit is, uh, um, has, um, it, it's a two cycle circuit. So there is a first part that computes only the XOR of two variables and then is sampled by a register. And then uh, the other part is, uh, you know, we sample the value of variable two and then we XOR after the two, uh, the two register, we XOR the value of the, of the two registers, okay? By applying the algebra, we get uh, some, a set of, you know, a, um, circuit representation that um, um, represent the regular output of the function, the output probe that we can, uh, we can put, what is the information that we can get from an output probe represented by the circuit, uh, the intermediate circuit here, and the, the value associated with the inner probes that we can put on the circuit. These are all computed by, the, by our algebra. So as a last step, uh, towards our goal, we want to convert uh, then what we have um, produced into something which uh, is a correlation matrix. Um, we consider the fact that any Fourier expansion of a Boolean function is an element of the group algebra of over F2, sorry, over the field of rationals. Um, so it's a group algebra of F2. And uh, group algebra is like a vector space with a multiplication, which is this, in this case, is, it's uh, the convolution. And actually this is a witness of a catamorphism said uh, by using the terms that we introduced at the beginning of this talk. And uh, this, uh, um, the Wolf's tr transform actually, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's an extension. It's built above the Fourier expansion, we know. And uh, it is a bit trickier to build as an algebra morphism. So here it's represented only by a simple morphism between domains. So summing up, we, we have built a path that allows us to start from a, an expression of the circuit, compute by means of an algebra morphism 
uh, a set of expression that describe the information that we can get from the uh, output probes and inner probes, and then a path uh, to, you know, from this representation into the um, correlation matrix associated with the, uh, with the circuit itself. Now, just to give an example, going back to the original domain-oriented masking, uh, one can apply the previous approach, um, the previously exposed method to derive the following equations, the one that you can see on the right, which collect the relevant output and inner probes. Note, for example, that the third and fourth equation, these are uh, the output uh, um, extended probes and can be factorized into something that is directly correlated with the input shares, okay? This means that this gadget is not robust, strong, and non-interferent, a fact that is very well known in the literature, but in this case, we are able to symbolically derive it from uh, the actual circuit itself. And interesting, this is among the factorization that a cut tool might, might look for, for to optimize a circuit. So, uh, that specific uh, feature could be used also for detecting if a circuit is strong and non-interferent or not by applying this algebra. So I have implemented the, this F algebra in uh, the ASCII language, which provides good support for uh, functor algebras and recursion schemes. And the program is also able to uh, read, uh, you know, intermediate files that are annotated using, using the mask verif syntax, another tool that is uh, commonly used in this field. And I have benchmarked it against netlists fr coming from the uh, mask verif repository again. And uh, uh, the computation was done on a single processor at 2.9 gigahertz. And um, actually, here you can see the time that it takes to check whether the uh, corresponding circuits, which are all, all of which are multiplication, uh, except uh, the catch-up one, which is uh, the S-box. So as you can see here, the time uh, represented on the on the third column. Um, what we could say we can say about this? Well, actually, the performance results are not that encouraging. In fact. Uh, for evaluating a complete uh, uh, deprobing security for the DOM multiplication gadget at the fourth order, it takes more than 22 minutes, while uh, mask verif, verif takes less than one second. On the other hand, uh, compared with other works, works uh, um, like Bloem, for example, and the results are uh, the same order of magnitude. I'm going to conclude my talk now. So summing up in this work, I tried to connect the dots between probing security and, and previous glitch treatments by trying coherent, to be coherent with the, the current, their strong algebraic focus. So unfortunately, uh, this, uh, this approach is not efficient, uh, but I didn't try to push any particular tactics on that uh, other than computing the world worst transform. And um, however, we have uh, you know, devised a path to really work within the worst transform perimeter. And um, this is pretty much uh, what uh, I wanted to talk about today. Yeah, thank you very much. We really appreciate it. it, it it's a very interesting uh, topic. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you for the invitation.